Hi everyone. So I'm going to record a video and I'm going to talk through the presentation on the PowerPoint and look at the questions in your workbook and support you in answering the questions. I've not done anything like this before so you might have to bear with me. Um, as I say it's, um, it's new to me so let's see how we get on. So we're going to look at Unit 3, um, looking at the uh, protection and safeguarding of children and adults in healthy social care. So I've got some notes and I'm going to look at the PowerPoint presentations as well. And you can open the PowerPoint presentations to support you, um, you know, when you're listening back to, to this, this, this presentation. So as I say, we're going to look at safeguarding and safeguarding is everybody's responsibility and safeguarding means we're protecting the, the, the people in our care so the children the young adults the, the, well, the adults and the old and the younger adults we're protecting them we're safeguarding them we're protecting them from harm and throughout this unit we're going to look at the different um, types of harm that that um, may may be made to a child or an adult um, we're going to look at the signs and symptoms of those different types of harm. We're going to look at abuse. We're going to look at um, what you would need to do if you've got concerns, um, you know, and, and the procedures in place for that. But we're going to start off by looking at vulnerable adults um, first of all. An, an, adult, an adult is a class is somebody over the age of 18 years of age. So on, one, on the slide you have got eight different types of adults and I'm going to read you through those eight different types. And while I'm reading through them, just have a think yourself when you hear the different types and obviously you can see them as well. And I want you to think about who, whether you think they're a vulnerable adult or not, okay? Which ones of these eight are vulnerable adults? So number one is an adult in their in their twenties with a physical disability, so they use a wheelchair. Number two, a person aged nineteen who lives alone. Number three, a single parent of three children. A lady in her mid thirties with Down syndrome is number four. Number five, an adult who has broken their legs, so they use crutches. Number six, an elderly widow who has just returned home after a new replacement and has no family nearby to help. Number seven, a man in his mid-forties who has learning difficulties. And number eight, an older adult with dementia. So, have a little time just as you've heard them, you know, have a think about them. And then you'll see on the next slide that there are some ticks, some green ticks next to the ones that actually are vulnerable adults. And you will see that out of those eight, four of those adults come under the vulnerable adult criteria. Number four, a lady in her mid-30s with Down syndrome. Number six, an elderly widow who has just returned home after a new replacement and has no family nearby to help. Number seven, a man in his mid-40s who, who has learning difficulties. And number eight, an older adult with dementia. Now, what this exercise does usually bring up when we do it in class, in a group environment, is that there are lots of surprises, there are a lot of discussions around the different types of adults and why there are only four. And usually somebody might come up and say, well, the, the adult who's broken the leg, they're on crutches. Now, actually, you know, they may not be used to crutches, it could be a short term thing, They'll get used to the crutches and there will be support there to help them with the crutches. However, they're not classed as vulnerable currently because they have broken their leg. Um, a single parent of three children, so there's no disputing that is a very really a really big job. Bringing up children is a really big job and somebody doing it on their own actually is, is hard hard work. Um, I have with two people, but when you know single parent is hard work. Um, but Currently, they're not classed as a vulnerable adult. Obviously, they will be, there will be support there, again, if they need it. Um, but currently, they're not, 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 not classed as um, vulnerable adults. Now, if we move to the next slide, you will see 
the definition of um, a vulnerable adult is an individual over 18 years of age who is vulnerable because of a disability or illness or are un unable to take care of themselves, protecting individuals' health, well-being and human rights and working to keep vulnerable adults free from harm or neglect. So that's the definition of a protection of vulnerable adults. And if we move to the next slide, you will see um, examples from the slide before um, with the adult who has Down syndrome, dementia, illness, um, frailty after a knee replacement. So that's why those four adults are classed as vulnerable. And this is why living alone, being a single parent, using a wheelchair or using crutches does not make someone immediately classed as vulnerable if they can still take care of themselves. So also you'll see here there's another definition to the Department of Health says that a vulnerable adult is a person aged 18 years or over who is or may not or may be in need of community care services by reason of mental or other disability, age or illness and who or may be unable to take care of him or herself or unable to protect him or herself against significant harm or exploitation. So hopefully that's explained that a little bit more and it will help you with your, your, um, your first question on Unit 3, which is actually question number 16. So we're now going to look at question number 17 and it's asking you to define safeguarding children. So as I said at the beginning, we, we have a responsibility to safeguard adults and children and children are... Um, do need protecting from harm and um, because they're young then they're not always able to make choices for themselves or decisions for themselves so they actually need protecting from all different types of harm um, and abuse and, and neglect and we're going to look a little bit further um, in the next question at that it obviously in more detail and um, we're asking for um, the definition of safeguarding children And you will see on the slide here, promoting children's well-being and development, preventing impairment of children's health or development, protecting children from maltreatment. So that's the definition of safeguarding children. And as I say, as we move along, we're going to look at it in a lot more detail. But that should help you answer question number, um, number 17. So we're now going to look at question number 18 and question number 19. Now the questions are they're both the same however one of them is looking at adults and one of them is looking at children so 18 is adults and 19 is children so 18 is asking you to explain the term harm abuse and neglect in the context of protecting vulnerable adults in your answer you need to show the main types of harm abuse and neglect for adults so First of all, I'm just going to talk you through the different types of abuse and you'll find these on the slides in the PowerPoint presentation for Unit 3, which is um, in, on, on um, the Teams app. And you've opened it, hopefully. Um, so there are six main types of abuse and four other categories of abuse. OK, so we're going to start looking at six, uh, sorry, yeah, the six main, main types. Okay, so I'm just going to run you through the, the six main types and tell you a little bit about each one and then further along we're going to look at different signs and symptoms that you may come across to notice these types of abuse. So the, 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 the six main types, so we have physical abuse which may involve physical violence, misuse of medication, inappropriate restraints or sanctions. So anything physical that will harm or hurt a child or an adult um, obviously um, comes under physical abuse. Then we've got sexual abuse so that may involve penetrative including rape and oral or non-penetrative acts, rubbing, kissing, touching clothing, 
creating of pornographic images, being made to look at sexual images, images or acts. They all come under the sexual abuse um, category. Um, and then we've got psychological abuse. So that includes emotional abuse, threats or harm or abandonment, deprivation of contact, humiliation, blaming, controlling, intimidation, harassment and verbal abuse. So that comes under the umbrella of the um, psychological abuse. The next one is financial or material abuse. So this includes theft, fraud, exploitation, pressure in connection with wills, um, or properties, inheritance, or financial transitions, misuse or misappropriate, misappropriation of property, possessions or benefits. We've got number five, which is neglect and acts of omission. So including ignoring medical or physical care needs, a failure to provide access to appropriate health, social care or educational services, withholding um, medication and um, withholding adequate nutrition and heating. So they all come under the neglect and acts of omission. And then finally, number six on the six main types, we've got discriminatory abuse, which includes racist, sexist or abuse based on a person's disability. So they're the six main types. There are then four other types of um, abuse. And one is domestic abuse. So including psychological, physical, sexual, financial, emotional abuse and um, a so-called honour-based violence. We've got modern slavery, including um, slavery, human trafficking, forced labour and domestic servitude. You will also see on the slide there, there's an example that there was a car wash just in Levenshoom in Manchester, where workers were found to be modern slaves. Number three is organisational abuse. So this includes neglect, poor care practice with um, an institution or specific care setting, such as a hospital or a care home. And then finally, self-neglect includes a wide range of behavioural neglect into care for personal hygiene, health or surroundings and includes behaviour such as hoarding, so that's neglecting the person neglecting themselves. So they're the, um, the different types of um, abuse. Okay, so to, to, to support the, the question number 18 and 19, we're going, because it's asking you to explain the term harm, abuse and neglect, so on the slide it breaks it down that little bit further um, and it gives you some examples of the types of harm, abuse and neglect. And the first one is looking at the number 18, it's a vulnerable adult. So if we break it down further, you will see that the type of harm, abuse or neglect, so we'll look at physical abuse first of all. And this, um, you know, an example of this, of this is physically hurting a service user by hitting, pushing or grabbing them. So obviously, you know, this, this definitely shouldn't be happening, but these are the, the main types of harm, abuse and neglect that you may, it may come across. Hopefully you'll never have to experience any of this, but you will need to know, as I said before, you'll need to know the signs and symptoms of these, of these things because it's really important that if you spot something like this, then you act upon it as immediately by following your procedures when you start, um, in, in, in health and social care, in a new job work with adults or children, you will be given um, safeguarding policies and procedures of the setting. You will go on further safeguarding training and that safeguarding training is updated on a regular basis just to make sure that you know any changes that may have, have been brought in um, and also to make sure you know that like I say, you may never have to use this, but you need to know what to do if you do. And if you're not, you've not used your procedure for a while, you you know you need to keep on top of what those procedures are. So it's really important. And from experience of working in um, and visiting different childcare and um, health and social care settings, um, you know some um, use good practice where they may have a policy or procedure of the week. They'll have it in the staff room. It may be on the wall or on the table, and um, they'll you know for that week. 
there um, will be asking you to make sure you read it and then there are a number of ways of, of, of um, the management ensuring you know so they might do a quiz at the end of the week they might ask some questions at the team meeting but it's just to, to keep these things in your mind because as I say if you're not using procedures because thankfully you won't have to but it is important that you do know as I, as I said before so uh, that you know it's really important that you keep yourself up to date with with your safeguarding training and any changes that might happen um, with, with the legislation. So we've got sexual abuse. So um, obviously um, with adults, so it's raping or undertaking unwanted sexual activity with service users. We then look at neglect. So not giving help, support or med medical care. So you, you know, neglecting somebody like that. Uh, emotional or psychological abuse, so shouting at service users, threatening them, all, all uh, is all types of different types of abuse. Financial abuse, so using the service users' money, using their belongings brought with their own money. You know, you can't. You, you might be working with with an adult. You might be taking them out um, to the to the local shop, and they might they might want to buy you something, but you can't do it. You know, it's um. It's their money you're you're working. You can't take from 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 a service user from a resident that you're working with. Um, it's really important that you know that you know that and that you don't do that. Um, self harm, self or self self neglect. So not not reporting concerns of self harm, not to, not supporting or reporting self neglect. Again, it's really important with adults and children. If you see something that you you feel is not right you need to re record it and report it you need to follow your procedures and um, don't think that somebody else will do it somebody may have actually disclosed something to you it may have taken a lot of courage to do that and if you're going to not you know you're just going to dismiss it or just think oh well somebody else will deal with it then obviously you know you're, you're, you're not following your procedure you're not doing your job you're breaching your contract it's really important because they might not tell anybody else and that could get worse um, and you know that person could get seriously injured could, it is really important that you do take on board if you see or hear anything that you know is safeguarding we've got discrimination so being um, racist or sexist not wanting to care for someone because of their race or gender again you you know you can't be doing that it's really important we, we, we value everybody we follow them as individuals and as you work through um, the course we're going to look a lot more on this about looking at individual needs um, we, we, it, you know it carries on this throughout throughout the course and then institutional abuse uh, not allowing service users to have person centered care and giving them no choices effective for treating everyone in, in the care the same and again this is something that we will look at throughout the course there's a whole unit on person centered care and support and again we, we also look at equality and inclusion and it all comes down to the person centered care we're all individuals and this institutional abuse by treating somebody exactly the same it's we can't do that because we're all different we've all got different needs different likes you know if i was given um toast every day for my breakfast or everybody was given toast, not everybody might like it. I like porridge for my breakfast, so I actually wouldn't really enjoy toast. But because and that class is institutional abuse, even though that sounds quite quite hard because I'm talking about giving some breakfast, but what we're talking about is not asking people what they want and treating them all the same. So as I say, we'll look at that in a lot more detail on, on other units as well. Oops, sorry, I thought I paused it then. So we're going to look at number 19, question number 19 now. Um, and again, similar to what we've looked at with the adults on question 18, but we're going to um, look at harm, abuse and neglect in the context of um, safeguarding children. So again, it's on the PowerPoint presentation, it's on the slide. So we're going to look at the different types. So we're going to look at physical abuse, so hurting a child by manhandling, hitting, shaking or pushing them, which, you know, quite quite rightly speaks for itself. You know, um, we, we, we cannot be hitting children. We cannot be smacking them. We cannot be punishing them. Again, we'll look at 
um, when you're working in setting with children, there are ways of managing behaviour, um, positive ways of managing behaviour, and we'll look at that in, in a bit more detail throughout the course as well. Um, but, you know, definitely we, we, we do not hurt children. We cannot hurt children. Sexual abuse, raping a child or showing them sexual images, things like being mindful of uh, when you are working with children, if you are going, um, you know, online is a, a really big a big um, technology and going online using the internet with uh, children can use it themselves you know they're very very okay with it they know it better than you know it better than me my granddaughter she's only one she can use her mobile her dad's mobile phone but you know we need to be mindful of the sites that children are accessing so we need to make sure we've got protections if we're working in uh, child care environments you know we need to make sure they're in place and um, because Obviously, you know, um, and also we need to be thinking if children are seeing them um, maybe at home and things like that. Uh, neglect, so not meeting the physical needs such as cleanliness or the psychological needs such as praise and the love of children, which obviously then goes back to um, managing the behaviours of physical abuse. You know, we really, really do need to be kind and, and really praise children, focus on the positive. And, you know, if we're putting children, um, you know, if we're neglecting them, obviously they're not going to feel worthy and it's going to affect their, their, their well-being and their, and, their, and their development further in life. It's going to really set them back. Um, emotional abuse, um, telling children they're unloved or worthless. Again, something else, if we're putting, you know, being put down all the time, we're just not going to feel worthy. We're not going to feel, we're not going to, want to love ourselves if other people are saying things nasty about us and not not be you know. um and then uh, bullying so this could involve various methods so um you, you know i'm sure you've heard bullying the term bullying before so the different methods so it could be verbal intimidation physical bullying so hurting um hitting it's very common by a technology so again cyber bullying Again, technology, as I said before, it's massive. It's it's the future. It's you know we as well, you're watching me on this. We're doing our work through through our teams. That you know it's definitely um it's the future, and the the children um are using it, texting as well um and using the mobile phones, self harm, allowing a child to self harm, not reporting concerns or offering support. Again, in the world we're living in today, we hear a lot about self-harming and people and uh, children feeling feeling depressed, and um, you know we, we we hear a lot of suicide as well. So you know these are the, these are the, the signs that we need to be aware of. Self-harming could be a sign. Well, it's a sign that something's not right. So we you know we don't ignore it. All of these we can't ignore. We're in a position where we have to do something about it, and it's really important that we do. And then institutional abuse. So treating all children the same regardless of their needs and differences and we talked about that with the adults it's the same you know we're not all the same adults are not the same children are not the same so we need to um, focus on on their needs and if they're treating if they're being treated the same then that's obviously institutional abuse So I apologise, I realise that I forgot to pause, so you'll get me, um, you'll see me thinking about what to do, which one I'm going to talk you through next. But, um, so obviously those, um, question 18 and 19, so um, just make sure that you explain, so by giving me an 
explanation, you know, give some examples to explain the term harm, abuse and neglect, and then um, show some of the main types of harm, abuse and neglect that we talked about for adults and for children. So, thank you. So we're now going to look at some of the indicators and signs of abuse, harm and neglect. And this, these next few slides will help you when we come to look at page 29 all the way through to page 37, okay? Because there are some scenarios that you're going to be looking at and this information I'm going to talk to you next and obviously the slides will help you when you're answering the, the, the scenarios when you're looking at them. So we're looking at indicators and signs of abuse, harm and neglect. Now, within the scenarios, when we do look at them, um, you will you will need to say, you know, you'll look at the scenario and you'll see what's happening, and then you will say what the indicators are. So it's you know it's important that you, you, you take these on board and you have a, have a think and maybe make some notes on these um, before you do the scenarios. So the indicators of signs of abuse and harm and neglect in adults. So there may be behavioural changes. So again, you you know you get to know your your um, the service users really well. You could be working with someone for quite some time, and um, you know you'll notice some of these indicators, the, the changes in the behaviour, and you'll be thinking there must be something, something's not going, you know, something's not right here. So um, obviously, you know, these are the sort of things that you you may come across. Uh, withdrawing from activities and social life again you'll get to know them well so these indicators are going to be concerning for you um, not being able to concentrate on the task so again you've got somebody who usually is quite focused and then they're not they're not concentrating so obviously that's going to um, be a sign that something something might be happening or not quite right uh, being, uh, being unable to fall asleep or stay asleep, again, you might notice that. And um, having a lack of confidence, so it might be that you've been working with this person for some time and they usually are very confident and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, they're lacking confidence or it could be somebody that you are working with, um, uh, somebody new that you're working with and you've noticed that they the lack confidence or some of these other indicators. So, you know, it's important that you, you are aware of, of, of indicators for this. Um, with children, um, very similar, some of the, the, the indicators, so behavioural changes, again, same as with adults, you might know a child well, and all of a sudden some of their change in behaviour would, would give you concern. Um, attention seeking, so um, sometimes uh, children um, do seek attention for very for different reasons. But again, you know these are signs and indicators that something might quite might not be quite right. Something might be happening. Um, withdrawing from friends and um, teachers again, and um, so just sort of like isolating, going quiet, withdrawing from talking again, another one. Not being able to concentrate on their schoolwork. So. Um, Obviously, they've got something on the mind, so they're not focusing on the schoolwork. Um, tiredness from the sleeping class. So, uh, you know, things might be going on at home. Again, you, you know, you need to look at what it could be. And we talked, um, one of the ones before was domestic violence, domestic abuse. So, it, you know, it could be their parents, um, there's, there's, there's things going on at home, and domestic abuse is keeping that child awake. At night, and um, so obviously then the next day they're tired, and then falling asleep in the class, and having a lack of confidence in their ability to do tasks. Again, we talked before about um, you know putting putting children down and not 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 praising them and just making them feel like they're not worthy. So you know this could be something like that if they've got not got confidence in themselves. Somebody could be telling them. You know, like I say, we need to build children up. We need to give them the confidence to believe in themselves for for what they can do. And if somebody's not doing that, that they they could be the indicators of those different types of um, abuse.
So it's really important that you know the indicators and the signs of the different types of abuse that we mentioned on one of the earlier um, videos when we were looking at the different types of abuse. So we're going to start, and there are slides on the PowerPoint, we're going to start looking at the indicators and signs of physical abuse. So you've got unexplained bruising. So especially children, children fall over lots and lots, um, usually get bruises on the knees and on the hands, that's up the head, but unexplained bruising, um, where they don't usually get bruises. So um, grass marks, uh, bruises, finger bruises, so we may have, have grasped them, um, burns our skulls, broken bones, um, frequent fractures to the fingers and the toes, and behavioural changes, so what we talked about earlier with behavioural changes, so attention seeking, withdrawing, being angry, lashing out, lack of confidence and the ability to sleep and tiredness, which we mentioned earlier on. So these are some of the indicators that um, are caused by a physical abuse where somebody is being physically abused. Indicators and signs of self-harm. So um, a person could have cuts on the wrist, um, flash marks on the wrist, scratch marks and again you will see the behaviour changes is a sign of all the different types of abuse so this comes up on every slide so again it's really important that you recognise any behavioural changes as individuals. Indicators and signs of neglect so um, a person could be constantly hungry, they could be stealing food because of the because they're hungry because they're not being fed, you know, they're being neglected. They could be dirty, they could be smelly, um, their appearance, um, you know, they could be inappropriate dress for the weather, so they, you know, they, they might be dressed in, um, in summer clothes in when, in, when it's winter, no coat, you know, for an example. The clothes could be inside out, could be back to front, um, so it could be that they're getting themselves dressed because they're being neglected and then, you know, they're getting themselves dressed. Uh, another one, the broken bones, uh, frequent fractures to the fingers and the toes, and again, the behavioural changes. Indicators and signs of sexual abuse. Bruising to the genital areas, cuts to genital areas, bruises to the buttocks, frequent urine infections, um, STI, sexually transmitted infections, um, pregnancy, using inappropriate sexual language, so children and people with learning difficulties, so you know, language that's used that is not appropriate for their age and things they shouldn't know about, and again, any behavioural changes with individuals. Indicators and signs of financial abuse. So this relates to social care really and not child care. So somebody suddenly unable to pay bills when they used to be able to manage perfectly okay so this could indicate somebody is taking their money missing personal uh, possessions so things like jewelry so you may notice that things have gone missing um money with money being withdrawn from bank accounts um and a change in a person's will and again the behavioral changes they're all indicators of financial abuse. So what should you do if you think a child or a young person or service user is being harmed, abused or neglected? Now, I'm going to talk you through, you know, the, the process with the next two slides, but, you know, I just want to stress how important it is that when you do start at your setting, you listen, you take note, you read your policies and procedures, you do the appropriate training with for, for safeguarding so you know exactly what you should be doing. And as I said earlier, you know, we can't ignore it. We can't think somebody else might might take it on board. You need to take it on board. It could be the hardest thing that you might ever have to do. You might have to take something further to the safeguarding officer. But in all this, you've got to think you're doing it for that person, for that child, for that adult, you're doing it to protect them. They might not be able to voice their, you know, and say it themselves, so you can do it for them.
So what should you do? So the do's and the don'ts. And again, it's on the slide. So, um, you know, you can go back and have a look at this. So it's after say, do ask the person, ask for the child. Do listen to them. Just going back to asking them, obviously, just, you know, again, with, with the procedures, you'll, you'll see that sometimes, you know, we, we can't question people. We won't be asking them too much because sometimes, you know, we, we have to leave that to the experts. But we might just be able to say some sort of question just to get a little bit more information to help us to support that individual appropriately. Do listen to them. Do assure them. Do tell them you're going to the, you're going to report it to get the help, and that's another really important. Well, they're all important, but you know this one. Just if somebody tells you something and they ask you not to tell somebody, you cannot promise them that because you need to help them so you will say to them look i will only tell the people who need to know and that's something that we'll cover again with the safeguarding procedure you know who you actually tell when you have got these concerns do you make notes using um the person and the child's words so that is really really important to take notes to write things down but only write what you know or what you've been told. Don't write what you think is happening. Obviously, we can think about the indicators like we talked about the abuse, but you just need to write it down in your own words. What actually happened? How long you were talking to that person for? I have actually been involved in a safeguarding incident when I was a childminder. Uh, one of the children just closed some information to me. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I'm not going to lie. However, I would do it again tomorrow without a doubt if it was to save a child from harm or an adult. It was an actual child that I, I was involved in. Um, they disclosed some information to me. I had to um, take it further. And after investigation, I actually did go to uh, be a witness in court and stand up. As I say, that, that was, it was horrible. Um, but I knew I was doing it for that child and I did get questioned and one of the questions um, you know they asked me how long I was talking to the child and you know it actually was only a few seconds that you know when she told me this information I would, would stress so much to record it on paper it, it you have to anyway you know you will have to record it um, just obviously so that you can remember what it said as well so that you know and that piece of paper as mine was was used in evidence you know and they want to talk through my notes that I've made um but don't let me as I say don't put, let that put you off because like I say it, it wasn't a nice time but it, it's something that we are we are going to be working in health and social care and we are professionals and we have to look after the people in our care and follow our procedures like a professional um and say, do follow the safeguarding procedure at your work. That's, that's really important. And most safeguarding procedures are, um, are going to be the same because the safeguarding, you know, we follow the same procedures. But you just need to check who you might need to record and report this to. It might be a different person in one setting as to opposed to another. So it's usually a safeguarding officer. Do report your concerns to the safeguarding team, as I say. The don'ts. Probably what I've just talked about, but uh, do not ask any questions if they're open because this can be leading. So again, you know, just ask as close questions. Do not promise that you can keep it a secret. What we just talked about. Do not let them. Do not um. Um. Do not share information with others in your team. I would stress the importance of that again. Only tell the people who need to know. Leave it to the safeguarding officer, the managers. They will tell the people in the setting who need to know about this. It, 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 you know, it, that's really important because um, it's confidential between you and the safeguarding officer and the appropriate people. Um, if we're passing it around our colleagues, when we think, you know, yeah, colleagues are our friends, but we can't be gossiping about it. We have to keep it professional again and keep it confidential with the relevant people who need to know. Um, and do not try and deal with it yourself. Um, 
there could be an, invest, an ongoing investigation already with the, the person, the child, so it's really important that you, you, take, you pass it on to the, the relevant people. And you'll see um, the slides with the five R's, and this is a good way um, of remembering you know, your responsibilities by using the five R's. And um, so the five R's are recognised, so you're recognising the, um, the situation, you're going to respond to the situation, you're going to report the situation, record the situation, and then refer. And again, the five R's, that will be the process. You might not be the one to refer it further, that could be your safeguarding officer, but this is a good way, if you think of the five R's, of how to remember what to do if you've got concerns about safeguarding, if somebody tells you something or you see something and you're not, you know, you, you, this is the procedure that you need to follow. Um, I'm just going to jump a little bit forward as well, and this, this information will help you to answer question 1.6, um, sorry, question 1.6, question number 20, which is out from 1.6, okay, um, which is on, um, it's just near the back the back of the questions um, and it's just to reiterate really what I said about confidentiality and there are some boundaries on confidentiality and the question is asking you to describe the boundaries and when you can share information and like I say to you before it's really important that you only share information with the relevant people um, the Data Protection Act and the General Data Protection Regulation the GDPR is there to protect people's information so that it's not um, shared with you know unnecessary people. So it's very very important, like I say, that you do follow your procedures, um, because you will be getting lots of personal information, and obviously with regards to safeguarding as well. So um, you know when you're answering the question, mention the Data Protection Act, mention mention the, the general data protection regulations. Put put that in your answer. And um, you know, and talk about when you can share information, and you can only share information with relevant people. So make sure that you put that in your um, in your um, in your answer to question number twenty. Okay, so we're going to look at these scenarios um, through the next few pages, um, and I'm going to talk you through the scenario, and then I'm going to. Um, just go through a little bit of how, how you need to you need to answer these. Scenarios are situations where it could be something that you may have come across when you're in working in health and social care. So um, it's like a little example of um, for you to be thinking about what you might do if you were in that situation. So the first scenario, and you'll see throughout the pages, um, there's different people, there's children, there's adults. So this first scenario is um, a number one is about, is about a child um, and um, it's a child called Toby and I'll just run through. So you're working at a nursery um, and a new child aged two and a half has joined the nursery today. You introduce yourself and ask him questions. You ask him his name, his favourite colour, his favourite toys, try to get him to settle in which is what you would do when a new child starts in the environment in a nursery. He tells you his name, he tells you he's called Toby, and he likes red cards, so you find two and you go and play together. So you find two red cards and you're trying to settle him in. However, during the time that you're playing with him, you notice a bad odour. Um, as you continue playing with him, you notice that his t-shirt's inside out, he's got dirty fingernails, his laces of his shoes are knotted together, and um, you know he's generally um, like I say smelly. So you've got concerns. You know what you need to think about. Um, what could be happening? Uh, what indicators are there of of abuse and neglect? And what actions would you take next? So this is where you will be thinking um, about what we just talked about. The indicators what you would do, if you question, who you tell, all those sort of things, okay? So, okay, so what could be happening to this child? Well, we think, um, I think, you know, in neglect, we talked before, didn't we, about some of the signs and symptoms of neglect, 
So this child's got his clothes on inside out. And he's, he's a bit, his odour is a bit smelly. So um, it's definitely um, a sign of a neglect. The indicators are so on the next so the first one you you know you write what could be happening on the first box the second one's asking you what indicators signs of abuse harm or neglect are they so the indicators of neglect are um toby has a bad odor his clothing is um not on the correct way his fingernails are dirty um and then what actions would you take so remember we talked about the five hours um you know obviously you need to you recognize it you need to respond report, record and refer um, and um, you might ask him who he lives with, you know, you could ask him that just so you've got a little bit clearer um, and then obviously you would uh, report it to the safeguarding team or safeguarding officer and like I say you definitely record it um, and obviously you keep it confidential between you and your safeguarding team, safeguarding officer and they might um, and again, they might um, ask you to um, speak to the parent at the end of the day. But again, you wait to find out what you know what they want you to do. Um, okay. So scenario number two: um, a teacher, a teenager. Um, I've got it on the piece of paper here. <laughs> so you're working in the mainstream secondary school as a teaching assistant. So that's your role. You're the teaching assistant. He's been working with the same student, Rory, for the last two years, and he's now in year nine and he's 14 years old. Rory needs a lot of support in the classroom um, as, he, as he has dyspraxia, and um, this means he gets um, very distracted easily. He often trips up and he finds it difficult to concentrate. Rory is generally well behaved and sometimes quiet, but today um, he'll not speak to you at all. Um, it's out of character for him. Um, so um, when when you ask him questions, he will not even look at you. It's like he's not listening at all, and and he doesn't want to respond to you. You keep trying throughout the day, but eventually, after lunch, Rory mumbles, "My granddad hurt me," and then he pushes his desk in front of him, throws his chair, narrowly missing another student, storms towards the classroom door, swears, slams it loudly slams the door loudly on his way out. So, think about what could be happening here. What indicators of abuse, harm and neglect are there? And what actions would you take in this situation? So, obviously, you know this child really well and this is really out of character for him, which is what we spoke about before on, some, on the indicators. So, there could be two things happening here. It could be a sign of physical or emotional abuse. He talks about his granddad hurting him, okay? Um, so that is, we've moved down, that is the, one of the indicators. Um, obviously, we, we noticed the indicators that he's not his usual self, he's out of character, he's very quiet and he won't speak. And then, um, obviously, the indicator is he's actually said that his granddad is hurting him. Um, so, um, Obviously, you know, he got aggressive and angry, he slammed the door, he's nearly hurt another another student in the classroom. So there are the indicators there. And the actions, again, that you would need to take is look, think about your five hours and you need to report this and record it. Obviously, you would need to go and check that, that Rory's okay and um, calm him down. He might actually tell you some more when you go and, and sit with him. Again, but we're not going to question too much, but we might be able to get some more information from talking to him and just getting that little bit more in indication. Um, but we definitely need to record it and we definitely need to speak to our safeguarding officer. Um, and again, they could give you a bit of support with that. Okay. Okay, so scenario number three is about looking at um, as a young adult. Okay, so you're working as a support worker for adults with learning disabilities. You're doing a one-to-one -one shift today with a um, 30-year-old lady called Jenny who has Down syndrome. You get you go in bowling and then you're going out to the cafe for lunch. At bowling, you ask Jenny what she has been up to, and she says that she has a new friend called Michael. 
you ask her how she knows Michael, and she said he's her boyfriend, and um, and then she tells you he's her boyfriend, and that um, you need to keep it a secret. You're unsure who Michael is, so you need to find out a little bit more. So at the cafe, you ask Jenny where she met Michael, and she said he's her tutor at college, uh, where she is currently taking an art class. She tells you they're in love and they're going to get married. She then elaborates and tells you he kissed her with his tongue and points between her legs. She's very excited and happy about it and the idea of being in love with Michael. So, what would you do? Well, this is a really, really, you know, obviously terrible situation. This definitely could be um, a sign of sexual abuse. Um, so, it's something that um, you obviously need to... Um, definitely report and record um, immediately. Um, the indicators um, are obviously um, she um, is telling you about the um, um, she's telling you about her the, the, the teacher's boyfriend, she disclosed that information to you. Um, also going back to um, the different sort of types of abuse um, it could be emotional abuse as well and um, this teacher, you know, is um, is using um, his position of power um, with the emotional side um, of abuse. Um, obviously, she's told you some uh, graphic details about what's happening and um, so the actions that you need to take. Uh, things about your five hours, you definitely need to report it, record um, to your safeguarding officer um, as soon as you possibly can because um, the... Um, um, Jenny, it shouldn't be happening and um, we need to stop it as soon as we can, she's in danger. Okay, so um, the next scenario, scenario number four, is an older adult and um, you're working as a home carer for a lady called Pavinga who has multiple cirrhosis um, and MS and are uh, helping her to go food shopping at the local supermarket. You browse through the stores together and chat um, and push her around. She appreciates you taking time out with her as she doesn't get out very often. At the checkout, um, pay for the food and she says, you can take my loyalty points. That's what the other carers normally do. Now, I think we spoke earlier about um, financial abuse. So this definitely comes under financial abuse um, because you um, you know you might think I know when we're in the classroom and um, people will some people will say well you know it's only points on a card you know you get like your, your supermarket um, points um, but actually it, it's not yours to take so this is called financial abuse so it's really important that obviously you don't take those points um, so that's sort of the indicators um, and actually she told you, she disclosed to you that other carers take her points usually. So this is something that you definitely need to report um, and record the, the actions you would take um, because you need to find out who the other carers are that are taking the points on her card um, with, with this financial abuse. Um, and finally, the last scenario is number five, it's elderly adults. So you're working in a residential care home and um, as you walk down the corridor, you notice a carer called Jade laid in bed with a resident called Barry. Jade is cuddling up to Barry and Barry is crying. So, you know, what could be happening here? What indicators of abuse, harm or neglect are there? And what actions would you take next? So this um, could be a sign of um, emotional abuse or sexual abuse. So these, this, you know, they're, they're, the different, they're the signs. Um, the indicators that you've seen are that you've witnessed it. You've seen, you've seen them in, in the, um, you know, you've witnessed the scene. Okay. Um, and you need to um, obviously, you know, find out why, um, why he's upset if Jade is his key worker. Obviously, this brings up to a lot of discussions as well. Um, you know, as, as a carer, you should not be in bed with um, with 
with the person that you're caring for. So that's definitely um, a no-no. Um, what would you do? You'd obviously report it to the safeguarding team. And again, make sure you record uh, what you've seen um, um, appropriately accordingly. Okay, so um, I hope that's helped you with looking at those scenarios. Again, you know, read through them again, make yourself some notes and um, use my um, video to help you. Um, there is a slide at the end as well with a review of the scenarios, which um, will help you to complete your workbooks as well. But just make sure, um, you know, when you're filling out your book, you answer the question accordingly. So the first question, what could be happening? The second one, what indicators are there of abuse and harm and neglect? And then what actions would you need to take? Okay. I just wanted to add something to um, the last um, scenario um, as it was um, a colleague that you saw another care worker in the room with um, the, 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 the adult um, and I just wanted to just to talk you through the whistleblowing procedure um, and you may have heard of whistleblowing if you haven't um, if you want to google it there's more information online as well but whistleblowing is um, if you do see a member of staff a colleague a manager you know, somebody in the workplace who are not following the safeguarding procedures and you see them, you know, inappropriate behaviour um, with regards to, like we said last time, about the care worker being in bed with the resident, with the service user. So whistleblowing is there to um, protect, protect everybody while it's investigated. So again, it's another area where it's confidential, so you would only share it with the relevant people. But if you see somebody you feel is not following the procedures, um, and also will it also be one with the loyalty points as well you know in somebody um, stealing you would need to um, use your whistleblowing procedure alongside your safeguarding procedure as well and again when you do start in um, the care environment in the health and social care environment you will you will learn about the whistleblowing procedure the safeguarding procedure and many more procedures that are in place but just want to just talk to you about the whistleblowing procedure okay So we're going to look at question number 21 now in your workbook and it's asking you to explain who is responsible for protecting vulnerable adults and safeguarding children and it's asking you to create a poster. So I know you've created a poster previously in the, um, in the unit 1 and the unit 2 and you can do this either on a piece of A4 paper or you can actually pop it Onto the bottom of your page where it says attach your post to this page, you could actually write your um, information on the page if you don't have any paper. There's a slide to support um, the question 21, which is outcome 1.7, and it's the responsibilities for safeguarding and partnership working. So you need to, on your poster, um, look uh, use at least three uh, professionals who are responsible for protecting vulnerable adults and I've got an example here in front of me I'm not sure if you can, if you can see it might be back to front actually but you can see on this poster um, it, it's been um, at the top it says who's responsible um, and this person's uh, chosen care staff, nurses and nursery staff um, and what you need, need to make sure you do so for example um, this person has chosen care staff and the question is asking you to explain who's responsible so the care staff need to know the procedures to follow if they suspect abuse or neglect and also need to keep up to date with regular safeguarding training so it's just talking a little bit about that person's role and what they need to do to protect the, um, the vulnerable adults and safeguard children so that's um, the example there to help you to complete question number 21. If we look at number uh, question number 22, and again there is a slide, it's um, outcome 1.8, and question 22 is asking you to identify what organisations should do to protect vulnerable adults and safeguard children, 
And again, this one, you need to give at least four examples of what organisations do to protect vulnerable adults and safeguard children. And it's an identified question, so you just need to write a little sentence next to um, you know, what you've identified. So, for example, we're going to look at the slide. Um, so, organisations must ensure that they have a valid and up-to-date safeguarding policy showing staff how to report concerns and what to do. And we've talked a lot about that throughout the um, throughout the video, haven't we? You know, it's important that you know what your safeguarding policy is and what the procedures are that you need to follow. So organisations have got to have that in place. They have to have a designated safeguarding officer, often called the the, the, DS, the DSO. Okay, it's um, you know DSO for date. Uh, for designated safeguarding officer, so um, they also sometimes call it that for short, some jargon there for you, but that's what sometimes they call it. So they have to have somebody there in place that you or um, somebody can go to if they've got concerns. They need to provide staff with safeguarding training, and again, we've talked about that throughout. You know, uh, we're, we're just touching on it here today in your workbook for the level one qualification, but it's something that you will keep up to date with and you will be continuously doing safeguarding training because things change and as I say you know you need to keep yourself um, so you know what to do. Um, ensure that all staff have an up to date DBS check so that's like your police check it looks um, to make sure that you are safe to work with children and adults. Recruiting new staff who are suitable to work in care settings so again with the recruitment making sure that staff are suitable um, to work with the, in the care settings. Make sure the environment in the workplace is a positive one. Staff need to trust the managers. So again, you know, we talked before about making, you know, praising people, giving them confidence, really, really being positive. Um, sometimes, you know, it's hard work working in health and social care and sometimes you might not feel like being positive. However, you know, you have to be professional and we go to work and we have to be the professional one with our the care the, 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 the service users that we're working with and then make sure the children or vulnerable adults in the care are given choices independence privacy dignity respect where possible and prevent institutional abuse from happening so again we're going to look at that further as, along as we look at some of the units and um, well, that's what their organization role um, is and then finally we're going to look at question number 23 um, which is going asking for at least five sources of support and information in relation to protection and safeguarding. Okay, so again, it's another identify at least five. So you've got, you've got to do five. You can do more, but five definitely, you know, will fit on. And again, you've got to, um, and there is a slide that will help support this. Um, it's, it's number um, slide to support the uh, one point nine. And on the slide, uh, just bear with me. On the slide, there are some examples on the slide there. Um, so, for example, National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children, so the NSPCC. There's Action on Elder Abuse. There's Age UK. There's Adults or Children Social Care. Um, so, what you need to do, um, there's the Samaritans. This is just an, another one that you can look at. There's child line and you need to write the name of the source and then just again write a little bit next to it about what they actually are, what their role is, okay, what they offer. Okay, so um, thank you very much for listening um, and I hope the video will help you and support you to complete Unit 3. Um, obviously any questions you can still give me a call and send me a message. And you can um, um, obviously make sure you use the PowerPoint alongside as well, which is on the, um, the Teams uh, platform. But good luck with Unit 3 and thanks for listening.